Thank you, uh, ma'am, very much for being with us. Now, the World Health Organization, in its, in its latest risk assessment, says, and I quote, given mutations that may confer immune escape potential and possibly greater transmissibility advantage, the likelihood of potential further spread of Omicron at the global level is very high, is high. Why is that the case, ma'am? What is it specifically about this variant that concerns us? Well, this variant has more mutations than any other variant that we've seen in the past. And the fact that it has arisen with all of these mutations makes us wonder what we missed on the path to this variant. Was this something that was uh, evolving in Africa and we just didn't pick it up until it wound up in Botswana and South Africa? Or is this something that came from an immunocompromised person that was unable to suppress replication of the virus, where the virus replicated for a long time against an inadequate immune response and wound up getting lots and lots of mutations? Whatever it is, the mutations are several and they are located in regions of the surface of the virus that are responsible for the binding of the virus and also at places where antibodies bind. Further than that, there are also mutations in areas where we know that T cells respond to the virus. Now, there are hundreds of regions where T cells bind and the mutations so far on modeling are in half a dozen places. But all of this taken together is very concerning because we have clearly greater transmissibility and potentially immune escape. So, Dr. Karg, again, uh, I'll just introduce a bunch of questions which people are asking and do share your answers with us. Firstly, when we talk about transmissibility, how much more transmissible is the new COVID variant? I realize the information is preliminary. Yeah. So, if we look at... Um, R naughts of viruses. We said that the ancestral Wuhan variant had an R naught of somewhere around 2.5 and Delta is estimated to be somewhere between 6.5 and 8. And there have been estimations that have made been made for this variant that say that it might potentially be several times Delta. I think that that is unlikely to be the case, but it does seem like this is a very transmissible variant. Just as an example, measles has an R0 of about 15 and is the most infectious virus we know. So somewhere between 8 and 15, if it's greater than 15, then it's going to be a virus that's going to infect practically everybody it comes in contact with. Doctor, uh, when we speak about... Um are not, I think it's important to understand this. When you say a transmissibility factor of say eight, it means for every one person who gets it, there is a possibility of eight more being infected. Is that uh, broadly correct? It's broadly correct if everyone is susceptible. But fortunately for us, we are in a situation where everyone is no longer susceptible. Because of the And vaccines. in India, because of vaccine and prior infection. So in India, we may have a small advantage because a lot of our people were infected before they were vaccinated. And we know that the combination of vaccination and infection gives you the broadest possible immune response. So we may be lucky there. But Dr. Kang, uh, what we are reading now is that... Um uh, people who've been uh, double vaccinated or even triple vaccinated are still contracting this. Yes, it's a proportion of people who, in whom we have data who had received two or three doses of vaccine. And I'm not that worried about people who have been vaccinated getting infected. The question is, that's important for transmission, obviously, and for the spread of the virus. But in terms of disease, are the people who are vaccinated doubly or triply, are they getting sick with the virus? And so far, the data that we have from those individuals in whom we have a history of vaccination, it seems like they were either asymptomatic or mild infections. Yeah. But this is something that we need to watch for. Which actually brings me to my next question. Does greater transmissibility mean greater severity of COVID? 
not necessarily. Some of the most transmissible viruses that we have do not cause severe disease. So if we are lucky, this may wind up being a very transmissible agent, but not one that results in severe disease. So for example, I'll refer you back to H1N1. Very transmissible virus, but fortunately for us, not as severe disease as many other influenza viruses. Professor Kang, I just want to go back to the point that you were talking about R0 or the R factor, the, the rate of replication of a, a particular virus. In um, a group which is perhaps single vaccinated or not vaccinated at all, if you have something more with an R0 of, of 15 and above, as may be the case with this new variant, it actually means that if you are not protected in some form, if you've not had COVID before, you haven't had uh, vaccines, one person who gets it could actually share it to 15 plus people who have also been unprotected, right? And therefore, the number multiplies exponentially. That is the worry, right? And the reason I well, ask this is because I just want to reaffirm the importance yeah. of vaccination. No, I, you know... In principle, you have it absolutely right, but I will point out that it doesn't matter. We don't know that it is 15 at the moment. Right. We know that delta is between 6.5 and 8. So let's take delta. Even with delta, in that situation of everybody being susceptible ar around one person who is infected, yes, it winds up being exponential spread. But what we do have to remember is that the world is no longer in a situation where everybody that surrounds an infected person is going to be completely susceptible, unvaccinated, uninfected. Right. Dr. Kang, next question. Will the vaccines work on the new COVID variant? We don't know is the short answer. And there are approaches that are already being taken by scientists in I know for sure the US and in South Africa, where one, they are developing pseudoviruses that will allow us to very rapidly test for whether antibodies that have been generated in response to vaccines can neutralize the virus or not. There are similar approaches being taken at the African Health Research Institute where they are doing the same kinds of assays with the live virus. Now that's a much slower process but gives you much clearer answers than using pseudoviruses does. So Dr. everybody is scrambling to figure out which vaccines are going to work best against the virus. But the important thing for people to remember is that we actually, if we need to, we can make vaccines quite quickly now, which puts us in a very different situation from where we were last year. And therefore the importance of uh, modified vaccines. Um, we don't talk about that. We talk only about the main vaccines, but we'd, we've already seen Delta. We don't have a dedicated variant of a vaccine against Delta. And this has just happened now. Why aren't we talking about modified vaccines? Well, actually, the variant that was able to escape the immune response the most was the beta variant. And both Pfizer and Moderna did develop vaccines against the beta variant using the beta sequence. And they did clinical trials immunizing people with the beta variant. And what they found was that it was an incremental advantage. So if you gave people a third shot of the old version of the vaccine, or you gave them a third shot, which was beta, on the back of two shots of the original version of, of the vaccine, there was a very tiny incremental advantage against beta mm -hmm. in the people that had received the beta uh, booster. And even the people that had received the third dose of the older version of the vaccine, their immune response broadened as well. That's why they did not pursue a regulatory pathway for the beta variant. Now, with this variant, which has many more mutations than the beta variant, will that be necessary or not? We'll have to wait and see. 